You look at the differential between high yield and investment grade, and that is clearly what is supporting your thesis this morning. Yep. Good morning. Good morning, Yusuf. Um, yeah, it is. I think, you know, we, we have seen a huge uh, compression between high yield and investment grade, uh, both in emerging markets overall and in the region since the peak of the COVID lockdowns in, in March and April. But um, if you look at it historically, just take that, take that two-month period out, we're still definitely at the wides, um, you know, over the last five, seven years. Um, and we think that there is more room for that uh, for that high yield uh, number to compress versus uh, versus IG over the next uh, over the next few months. And how do golf bonds then fit into that picture when compared to some of the key benchmarks? You've crunched the numbers. Uh, what are, what are some of the conclusions? Yeah. So even on the on the GCC side, I think if you look at if you look at GCC, uh, obviously the average credit quality in GCC is a little bit higher than EM, just pure EM high yield. Um, but if you compare that against uh, e, the EMIG space, uh, again you see that there has been uh, somewhat of a compression uh, since the since the March April timeframe. But again, from a historical point of view, um, they still do remain wider. Uh, we we would not expect the, the yields to sort of come back to the historical lows because uh, obviously some of these uh, some of these uh, impacts on the GCC economies are going to be long term, uh, and particularly in terms of uh, in terms of credit and in terms of deficits and funding deficits and so on. So credit spreads will probably be a bit higher than they were historically, but we still think that there is room for compression uh, from these levels. And what happens then to more specific sovereigns like Saudi Arabia, for example? I mean, the whole curve shifted lower overnight. Uh, that, that kind of trajectory is going to be limited on the basis of what you've just been talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 curve, has, uh, the curve has shifted a bit. Um, I think on the, on the IG side, Saudi obviously is, is firmly on the IG side. On the IG side, there's probably less room uh, for compression, we we have rallied a lot uh, since uh, since the uh, the lockdown uh, sell off, um, and I think that there is limited room, particularly obviously at this point, um, as the markets are are sort of um, you know looking to to U.S. elections and looking to vaccines and so on. Um, I think that you know in the next few weeks, uh, particularly on the IG side, we'll probably just see a range bound type market. Uh, but I think as we get um, as we get closer to the elections and once the election un uh, uh, uncertainty is out of the way, we could we could see a, a decent move on the high yield side, and, and I think that sort of forms the basis of our thesis uh, for positioning over the next uh, uh, few months. Abdul Kader, I listened to what uh, the Fed's Richard Clarida is talking about and the warnings he keeps underlining as to the economic recovery, you know, taking a little bit more time than many are expecting at the moment. Uh, you look at the situation in Europe, we're getting more and more infections from the coronavirus, and there, you know, there, there is a fear that we're going to get to a lot higher levels as we get closer to the end of the year. Uh, in the Gulf, is the worst of the economic impact yet to be seen? Because I look at Qatar's GDP numbers from overnight, I start to think there's still plenty in the pipeline potential. Yeah, I think you know, and if you look at the latest, uh, uh, if you look at the latest IMF uh, numbers that have come out of their review, uh, you know, they pretty much, if you look at the numbers from their April review versus their uh, versus the latest review in October, um, they've pretty much you know cut uh, forecasts across the region, and Qatar has been uh, the one that's most impacted. Uh, in, in the April review, their 21 uh, GDP number was 5%, and, and uh, in the latest review, it's down to 2.3%. Um, but uh, I think that so. So I think on a GDP on the GDP front, uh, definitely uh, you know the headwinds are, are still there. Uh, Qatar obviously is is buffeted somewhat by the fact that it is uh, the strongest uh, or one of the strongest credits in the region. Uh, it does have a uh, even the IMF is forecasting. A, a fiscal surplus. Um, so, from a, from a credit perspective, uh, it's in a pretty strong position. Uh, and while the uh, while the lower growth, you know, right. does, uh, will obviously have an impact, it'll it'll be less so than some of the other economies.
Uh, there was a little bit of caution from some Gulf countries about getting too aggressive with fiscal support package to offset the impact, the economic impact of the coronavirus. If things get worse, can you foresee some of these Gulf countries to go in uh, a little bit heavier with, with their packages? I think that's going to be again limited to the to the stronger countries, uh, Yusuf. I think that the uh, you know uh, countries like Oman and Bahrain are still going to have uh, difficulty to do uh, something around that. They just don't have the fiscal flexibility um, to 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 be able to do something like that. I think in in you know KSA, uh, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, there is a little bit more flexibility, and even though they may have been hesitancy initially, um, you know, I think if things do uh, get from bad to worse, at least we know that there is uh, there is the ability uh, to do that. I don't, I don't think that, that uh, you know, you can say the same thing about Oman and Bahrain.